Fit name it, I'm indifferent. I'm believing God to the existence of God is not judging them. I don't have proof. I don't know how to pray. They're judging themselves. You know, where is God in all of this? This is my home. God exists. What does it say about God that he created the orgasm? I don't pledge allegiance to anything. I don't pray. Only to God. If there was a God. And I thought I just have this understanding that life is hard. He could never love me after this. God is still good. Welcome to the Maybe God Podcast YouTube channel. I'm your host, Eric Huffman, and today I am so excited to welcome a legend in the world of Christian radio and podcasting, a man who has inspired the Maybe God team to run toward all the toughest conversations related to faith. He is the host of an award-winning weekly show on Premier Christian Radio. The show is based in the UK, but its audience spans the globe. It's called Unbelievable. And for the past 17 years, Justin Brierley has managed to host compelling, enlightening, and mostly civil conversations between Christians and non-Christians, theists and atheists, and liberals and conservatives. When it comes to conducting interviews that are both polite and productive, no one on earth does it better than Justin. He's also the author of an amazing book called Unbelievable, Why After 10 Years of Talking with Atheists, I'm Still a Christian. So, Justin Brierley. Welcome to Maybe God. Wow, thank you, Eric. I I hope I live up to that amazing introduction. <laughs> but uh, it, it's very it's lovely to hear that the the sh my show has in some way inspired you guys with what you're doing with Maybe God. It's it's fantastic. Well, thank you, and I, I I meant every word of that. And our team has been inspired by not just your content, but your approach to your guests. And um, it's been a learning curve for me personally, and you've been a guiding light in that process. And we'll talk more about wow. that in a bit, but. We're really grateful for you and your presence today. Well, thank today. you. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to, to, to be joining you today. Thank you. Well, thank you. And um, tell us a little bit about yourself before we get into what you do and, and, and the Unbelievable podcast and your books and things. Just about Justin, like who are you, where you're from, and, mm. and a little bit about your, your family. Well, I'm actually speaking to you from, from my home, which is in the southeast of England. Um, it's called Woking. Uh, and I live here with my wife and four children. Uh, my wife's the minister of a local church. And yeah, th life is a kind of a mixture of church, um, the work I do with Christian apologetics and theology, recording shows, videos, writing articles, books, that kind of thing. Um, and and yeah, we've, we've been based here for, ooh, well, about as long as my oldest son has been with us because uh, he was about one year old when we moved here <clears throat> and he recently turned 18. So... So yeah, we've been we've been based here for quite a while. Wow, were you raised Christian in a in a church? Yeah, I I very much grew up in a Christian family, um, and really, I suppose faith, in a sense, initially was kind of inherited from my parents. But it was in my late teens that it really became real for me, and I, I had an experience really at a a youth retreat where God just came alive in a new way. Um, and that really set me on the path to really taking faith seriously, though it didn't mean there weren't big questions along the way. I, I soon ran into a lot of arguments against God when I hit university years. And I guess I wrestled with some of that in that time. And that was when I started to read people like C.S. Lewis and others to, to kind of look into some of those questions. And and I think a combination of those questions, uh, my interest in drama, I was really into theater and that kind of thing at university uh, kind of led me down the road of media and and eventually led me starting at a christian radio station and yeah putting this idea out there of doing a weekly show where we bring christians and non-christians together so so that was kind of how it all started so that was the vision from the very beginning putting a, a christian against a non-christian or a theist against an atheist i mean some two people that disagree fundamentally together in the same show on christian radio yeah absolutely which is kind of um quite a, a bold thing to do as you can imagine um and it's very hard to almost imagine it happening in many other contexts uh i, I we you know if i'm honest we we we've had conversations sometimes about syndicating the show to u.s christian stations but i don't think there's as much of an appetite for having that kind of uh interaction between christians and non-christians because you will hear if you if you tune into the unbelievable radio show or podcast very often a cogent case against christianity being made but but hopefully equally a cogent case for christianity on the other side so it's not what you would call pat apologetics it's not just here are all the answers it's actually 
well here, here's a conversation and and yeah. conversations are complex and messy and you don't always have you know the christian winner you know clearly coming out or anything like that so so it but i think it's valuable because actually that's the way normal conversations happen um and i think it's actually really valuable in in helping both Christians and non-Christians. And, and that's been the joy of the show, that it has attracted this very diverse audience of Christians and yeah. non-Christians to to actually get talking and, and you know, to, to, to actually engage in conversation, which which is, I think, needed more than ever these days. Right. Um, did you face a pushback um, sort of early on from your producers or maybe advertisers? We, we face some pushback from our audience, I'll be honest, um, because before we, huh. you know, started podcasting, it was just on radio. And I'll be honest, you know, a number of listeners, when we started featuring atheists on the Christian radio station, and uh, they said, look, we've got plenty of atheists on the BBC. Do we need them on our Christian radio station <laughs> as well? And, and so kind of, I think in the end, if I'm honest, people who didn't like the format who didn't like to be challenged in that way, they kind of learned to skip the, the spot that it had on a Saturday. Others really yeah. loved it. You know, they said, this is what we need to be doing. We need to be getting out of the Christian bubble. You know, we need to be having these conversations. So right. so it, it, it drew the audience it drew. It was really, though, I'd say as a podcast that it really started to, to gain, gather steam, because I think at that point, the people who really wanted this, especially actually in your neck of woods in the US and elsewhere, who, who maybe didn't feel like they had this kind of a dialogue um, available to them they suddenly picked it up and they started really loving it and, and engaging with it and as I say a lot of non-Christians every time we started to feature maybe a well-known atheist and they might share the podcast on their blog suddenly I had a whole bunch of new non-Christian listeners right. joining us for the journey and 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 that was kind of interesting and challenging itself because I'd previously just been really speaking to a Christian audience now I was speaking I knew to a Christian and non-Christian audience. And, and so I felt more than ever the need to try and be as unbiased as I could be as the moderator, neutral, trying to give both sides a fair say so that I, the, the non-Christian listening would feel this is a fair space for me to hear these arguments. Mm, it's interesting. So both in American podcasts, let's say, and, and in the British uh, Christian radio sphere, you had non-Christians tuning in to Christian programming, which as you've indicated, is unheard of uh, in that space, right? It's unusual. You don't get a lot of yeah, non-Christians exactly. listening to K-Love over here. Like, that doesn't happen, I don't think. Um, and, and I'm not saying that... that's a bad thing. You know, every radio station has its kind of niche audience and its sure. demographic. But So I'm not, I'm not in any way critiquing stations that don't attempt to do that. But we, we were just... We, this was an experiment. And, and where it really worked the best, I think, is because you know, podcasting was in its sort of early days when we launched and we kind of managed to ride that wave. And, and it was just a joy right. to be able to kind of see something new happen, you know, outside of the usual yeah. ways in which these kinds of shows work. What do you think the difference is contextually between the UK where this could work on Christian radio and you mentioned trying to potentially syndicate um, your radio show here in the US? What, what, what are the differences that you perceive in the American audience that where there wasn't an appetite for that? I think it's it's arguably true that in America it is more possible to live in more of a Christian bubble. I think that's less true than it was when the show began because right. in a way the internet and the advance of a kind of more post-Christian secular society has has started to make the U US look a bit more like the UK. But but here in the UK I think we've been aware that Christianity has been very much in the minority and certainly sort of church going Christianity in the minority for several decades and to that extent, um, you know, mo most Christians are living and breathing and around non-Christians all the time. Yeah. And, you know, they can't necessarily shield themselves from that. So I think it's more natural to have a, a show where, where, where you're putting these kinds of conversations together because you, you can't sort of uh, be shielded from that so much in, in the UK context. We don't have a, a Bible belt per se. <laughs> um, I probably <laughs> live in one of the, if there is a Bible belt, I probably live in it here in the UK. But but even so, it's it's nothing compared to still what you get in the U.S. in terms of the Christian subculture that effectively exists out there, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Have you ever wrestled with concerns or worries about um, folks being led astray or away from Christ by, you know, the folks you're platforming and, um, uh, you know, uh, anti-Christian voices or non-Christian voices you're giving a megaphone to? Absolutely. I think that's definitely been 
something I've been concerned about. And the concern comes, I think, with actually when I bring two guests together, am I doing a good enough job at, at matching them well? Um, because I oh. uh, and and I wouldn't necessarily, you know, if I wouldn't necessarily say to a baby Christian, go and listen to every episode of Unbelievable. That's the best way to kind of, you know, <laughs> um, further your faith. Um, it it depends on the individual. I mean, there are just some Christians who uh, who when they come to faith, they they kind of really yearn for and hunger after this kind of intellectual kind of approach and this kind of back and forth and what they want to kind of really dig into it. Other Christians, you know, that's not going to be the the road by which their faith is sustained. So it will depend on the individual. My I've always said to myself, I think, look, I can't guarantee how what what impact this show will have on people. Everyone's on their own journey. And when they in- interact with Unbelievable, they may be heading towards Christianity and Unbelievable helps them in that journey. They may be heading away from Christianity and Unbelievable, you know, the conversations seem to cement that journey. I've heard both of those stories frequently from listeners of the show. And in the end, I just have to say to myself, look, look I think um, I think God is calling us to do this kind of programming, to have these kind yeah. of real, honest conversations, which don't kind of result in the christian always winning over the atheist necessarily where people will draw their own <laughs> conclusions and i just have to leave it to god and the individuals who are listening and say you know that that's up to them all i can say is i'm glad to say there has been a lot of great fruit from the show lots of people who, mm. who do say it has helped them to understand and defend and share their faith with confidence people who have come through from you know atheism to christianity and the show was maybe part of that journey in some way but as i say that doesn't stop other people saying "Mm, it didn't convince me justin or you know i I was on my way out and unbelievable i was more convinced by the 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 non-christians so uh you take the good with the bad and and you kind of leave it in god's hands as far as i'm concerned right no i i think the messiness of it is one of the best most compelling um things about your show and and some of what turns me off of um old school christian programming the standard fare we got used to um in the christian world is that it's just kind of saccharine and and neat and tidy and the christian wins in the end and the you know atheist has egg on his face or whatever and or comes to jesus even better it's like um that's not how these things work out in real life um very often and uh it's also part of what i appreciated about your book is just the the admission that you know there's never been sort of this uh situation on your show and all the many hundreds of episodes you've done where a non-believer has seen the light uh, you know on the air and come to jesus in some kind of a dramatic <laughs> moment but as think much of as the we ratings, might want that eric think of the ratings <laughs> if you did get that story because I, I that if i'm honest you know when i first put the idea out there that i think that was kind of going around in my head ah oh, we'll see you know mass conversions people coming to right. faith on air it didn't it yeah. didn't happen as you say because i mean as as you quickly learn you you don't change someone's mind in one hour of conversation usually absolutely in fact most of the minds that are being changed are usually the listeners who are maybe quite open to it i mean most of the time a lot of the atheists and and christians for that matter i get on there you know they're pretty certain about what they believe and then they're, they're not likely to change their views in the, in the course of one conversation right but but having said that there have even been you know among the people who have come on the show interesting journeys and stories and people who I interviewed, you know, five years ago, and now they're in a different place to where they were. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, the, the, everyone's going on a journey and you'll kind of interact with them at the point that they're on when they come on the show. Right. No, I think of one guest in particular that was brought to faith in Christ by the work of Richard Dawkins and uh, hearing him on your podcast, like uh, like just seeing through the arguments on the other side le- lead some people to, to profess faith in Christ. And I think mm. that most often will happen off the air um but yeah. you never know justin keep trying you might have that on-air conversion one day we'll see <laughs> <laughs> we'll what see. are among all the arguments you've heard from let's say the other side um non-christian arguments against the existence of god or against the legitimacy of christ or the bible what are the strongest arguments that you've heard or the strong the most compelling case that you've heard against what we profess as christians well, I, I think it probably is the one that most people run into at some point in their lives, and that's the problem of evil and suffering. I think that's that's always been the the biggest, hardest objection to mm. God and to Christianity, and for good reason. Uh, it is incredibly hard, especially when you come up against a real instance of what seems like gratuitous suffering or evil 
and it's very hard to to, to come to terms with with why a good loving god all-powerful god would would allow that so we've done that kind of question many times on the show um you know i've come kind of to my own place where i feel like i've i found a sort of an intellectual place where i can i can reconcile that with god um but it never stops the questions being really raw and real when when they're posed again you know by a new person and especially when perhaps that's been part of someone's journey away from faith you know they've, they've been through some trauma maybe right. connected to being in church or whatever it is and and i think that's really hard i think um i think sometimes related to that i suppose is is the question of why why hasn't the christian church done better very often if it is you know inspired by god and led by the holy spirit why is it so often toxic for some people and and why has it had so many occasions when it has gone in the wrong direction and everything sure. else those again those are those are critiques that are often hard to to answer um so so i think it's those kinds of issues around the the brokenness and the evil in the world and the way that christianity often fails actually in sometimes doing what it's supposed to do and following the example of jesus that those are probably some of the tough ones Thank you. And what about some of the the individuals, the people that offer these uh, counter arguments um, to Christianity? Um, who are the people that you find most compelling or convincing from that other side? Like, who are they? I, I, I I've, I've, some... I've picked up on like you. You're not very convinced by the Lawrence Krauss or the Reza Aslan, <laughs> but like, there there are others that you find more compelling. Yeah, I I'd, I'd say that a lot of those quite well known new atheist voices i don't actually find very compelling i think often their their criticisms are, are are fairly shallow and can be answered fairly adequately actually just with either you know a bit of biblical knowledge to answer the kind of problems they have about the bible or or indeed you know just just a better understanding or or the idea of the relationship between science and faith and that kind of thing um i think i think probably one of the most uh the toughest you know um, questions have come from sometimes ex-Christians and in one case I can think of you know an ex-Christian Bible scholar Bart Ehrman who I'm sure you're familiar with Eric who's who's written some you know best-selling books that are you know highly critical of whether the New Testament can be trusted the, the way that the New Testament documents came to us the transmission of them and those kinds of things and you Bart said is, Bart is Ehrman also... right Bart Ehrman yeah you broke Bart up a Ehrman. little bit yeah you're right mm. Okay, yeah, Bart Bart Ehrman and uh, and uh, Bart Ehrman is um, is also a very skilled debater as well. So when he comes on the show, you know that he's gonna you know put up a good kind of fight against whoever you've got coming on the Christian side. He has his right. own story of of having been a Christian and having lost his faith. So that all kind of mixes into it. And um, and I remember when I first had um, him on the show, and at the time his book Misquoting Jesus was a bestseller it was questioning the, the the historicity of the new testament documents do, how do we know that we've really got the original words and so on and i remember reading the book and you know having a sleepless night thinking gosh he, this guy is making some good arguments i wonder how this is going to go down on the show in fact when we did have him on the show we had him opposite um, a new testament scholar from cambridge peter j williams uh, in fact they've they've been on twice together now over the years and and actually you soon realize that there's always another side to every story peter j williams was mm. able to to show how in fact there's there's lots of reasons to really be encouraged and trust the transmission of the texts um as much as bart paints some things as negative you can also see them in a positive light um so that right. you know it, it it's it's always possible to kind of if you only read one side of anything you know get get a bit of a biased perspective on it but but certainly Bart also did a show, you know, with me on the problem of evil. And again, that's not as easy. It's, it's not as easy to kind of turn to history and textual criticism and that kind of thing to answer that kind of question. It's it's going to be a more of a philosophical, theological kind of answer. And and yeah, I, I think some people do better than others at, at actually meeting that kind of challenge. Right. And personally, how have you come to terms with um, that problem and how, how have you held to your faith? You know, hearing one argument after another that uh, you know on these grounds that uh, Christianity you know falls apart in the face of suffering and evil. Mm. Well, for, the first thing I would always want to say is that there are no easy answers to this. And and if I was to stand here and say I've I've discovered you know a, a perfect way of answering this, I'd it it would be foolish because um, 
if you say that you've already kind of i think lost the argument because you're you have to approach this with it with humility and understand that mm. when it comes to god when it comes to evil when it comes to human suffering it's very hard to actually understand what's going on behind everything we we, we only have a very limited perspective on it and we, i i sort of the first thing i'd want to do with anyone who's actually going through that suffering is not give them a theodicy um i would rather sit with them cry with them you know that's what people actually need most of the time so i think that's just a, a word of caution to those who do want to yeah. leap in immediately with with an answer but but having said that it, when it when it does come to the time for sort of those intellectual questions about why would god allow this i i guess i've i've come to the view through a number of different scholars and thinkers on this that have helped me to kind of put the pieces together c.s lewis very influential on me um and the way in which just at the very outset he he points out really that if you're going to have a problem of evil you you kind of still need god um it's hard to get rid of god because um by what are you measuring good and evil right and wrong justice right uh this comes to another sort of argument for the existence of god the moral argument if you're going to say that there's something wrong with the world you have to have a measure by which you can judge right and wrong and it appears to me on a godless universe in a naturalistic universe it's very hard to say that such a thing as right and wrong or even evil exists um it only seems to make sense that very concept if there is a god that grounds the idea of morality good good and evil right and wrong so that that's kind of your very first point is that that you kind of yeah. you know to have a problem of evil you kind of need a god that grounds the, the very concept why would that god allow evil though i mean uh i i think we 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 struggle to see from our perspective things that obviously are only open to god from a god's eye perspective uh, on these things i think though we can we can edge towards some kind of answers i think that for instance the fact that a freedom is is an important thing in human life means that there are obviously going to be situations in which we use our freedom for evil now if god were to simply step in and overrule every action that humans ever took that led to evil outcomes then we would just be robots we'd be automatons we we would yeah. not have free will and without free will you don't really have what it means to be human you can't love love is something that is freely given freely received so at the very starting point there's this kind of measure of freedom that god has given the world and that for me seems to to, to be a starting point to understand why we do live in a world where it's possible for things to go wrong is because actually love is only possible in a world where things can go wrong um that that kind of would be my my starting point um for maybe if i was in a conversation about this but there would be lots of other places i'd want to to go as well um with other things i mean at the center of it for me i would always want to end up with jesus christ and the fact that whether you think this is a good argument or not when it comes to suffering and evil in the christian story god is not distant from evil this is not an abstract concept or uh he came and he experienced suffering evil rejection yeah. humiliation abuse and for me that may be actually the one thing someone can hold on to if they're going through that that god knows what it feels like and that may still be a great mystery but it may be just enough for someone to kind of make sense of suffering knowing that that god has been through suffering and knows suffering and in some mysterious way as christians we are united with christ even in our suffering that for me you know is is a really significant thing mm, yeah you're a um not only a, a very uh, skilled host and interviewer uh, you're actually a really good preacher and i um wrote a quote <laughs> from a sermon of yours that i watched um you were on fire and it goes sort of it's in step with what you've just shared but you uh, concluded a sermon uh, that I saw online by saying, but I see a very different universe to Richard Dawkins. You'd been talking about Dawkins and mm -hmm. how the universe, according to him, is senseless without meaning, just indifferent. Mm -hmm. And when I look around, you said, I don't just see uh, physical processes and uh, natural laws. Sorry, I'm trying to read my own handwriting. I see love, you said. I see truth. I see beauty. I see hope. I see good and evil. I see a universe that's teeming with purpose and meaning. I mean, that is mm. a, a powerful um, message and another reminder, you're a man of many talents. But uh, I hear in that 
uh, conviction that Christianity is maybe not the only way to make sense of suffering, but it's a, it's a, it's truly a, a massive part of what it means to be Christian is that suffering is, mm. uh, we find, uh, we find meaning in, in it and more than that, we find God in the suffering, like in the suffering mm. because we worship and mm. follow a God who suffered. Yeah. I, 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 just I think, think that's, that's right. Powerful. That that's, that's really kind of you, Eric. I, I, I mean, when, when I've spoken on this issue and, you know, I've, I've kind of tried to summarize quite often the, the contents of the book in, in a sermon or two. And for me, there, there are, you know, I, I think Richard Dawkins is actually a great foil for, for being able to talk about why Christianity can make sense of life, the universe and everything, because because he is so quotable. And, and you know, one of his famous quotes is the, the universe, as we observe it, has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no good, no evil, no purpose, uh, uh, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference is, is his famous right. quote. And and the, the thing is that when you actually go and look at the universe, it just doesn't look like that. I mean, both if you simply looked at the actual science of what the universe is telling us, the fact that the, the actual mechanics of what our best science tells us about the Big Bang, the fine tuning of the universe, the way that the universe is written in the language of mathematics, um, consciousness the uh, life itself and, and the extraordinary complexity that it took for us to be here all of it submit seems to me not at all to sell this you this is some indifferent universe but that, goodness me it's really weird that we're here at all and why yeah. why would that be for me the the if if the arrow of evidence is pointing anywhere it's pointed towards some kind of purpose some divine mind behind the universe rather than this blind indifference and likewise when you even if you don't look out there in the universe you look inside us as i was mentioning there's this sense that humans do have this inherent dignity and value and again it's very hard to account for that on an atheistic worldview um because we all experience beauty love justice um good and evil as real things not just as kind of constructs of, of an unguided right. you know process so for me i i i think you know dawkins can be the preachers or evangelist best friend at times because it, yeah. he provides a perfect contrast so that you can say well look this is why the christian story does make sense of of us um in ways that i just don't think a naturalistic atheistic account can right and i confess i'm i'm quick to make a a, a meme out of richard dawkins to borrow a word from his book and um you know i think that is something i've learned from you as well to be very cautious about getting too carried away with um, making caricatures of our ideological opponents. And Absolutely, one, yeah. one instance that I found of an example of this from your experience and what you learned from was how you had written off the multiverse argument as a, you know, as a, a counter argument to the fine tuning of the universe. In other words, if you're listening to this, you don't know what I'm talking about. Fine tuning, uh, the <laughs> fine tuning argument says like, Everything um, was just so perfectly in the universe was just so perfectly uh, tuned or engineered uh, to allow for not only life, but intelligent life, human life, and that this was all meant to be from the beginning in creation. Um, and the multiverse argument sort of emerged, I don't know when, it feels recent, uh, as a, as an a the, uh, ideological opponent to that, um, uh, to that argument that many Christians were, mm. were so proud of espousing but you found uh, by interviewing a, a, an expert on the multiverse argument that christians should be really quick to listen here on uh, you know yeah. on issues yeah. like these where we want to rush to assumptions yeah absolutely I, I think i think i'd perhaps too hastily sort of written it off as just you know an attempt to get rid of the fine tuning problem and and a, a friend of the show somebody who's been on several times uh, an atheist who takes a, a lay interest in these issues and does online videos called skydive phil kind of he came on and we were talking about you know this argument and and it, particularly a, a video i'd done on this argument and, and he was sort of wanted to make clear and, and i you know took away from it that actually there is some there, there is at least a physical um theory for how a multiverse could have developed and that therefore it's it's it, it's not fair to simply label it as, as a desperate you know attempt to to get rid of the fine tuning problem there's 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 potentially a theory there um now right. the problem of course 
is that there is there are still problems for the multiverse because at one oh, level these theories are almost certainly impossible to prove <sighs> um empirically um because if it's a multiverse if, it, if it's other universes we're talking about you'll never be able to actually physically observe those in any way so, so for some yeah. scientists that just rules it out of being science altogether that so but having uh, and there are also quite complex reasons i could go into about why at a philosophical level lots of people think the mm -hmm. multiverse theory just is is very very unlikely but no it you're absolutely right i think i think too often in apologetics there is this danger of kind of leaping on what appears to be some great argument and thinking and and it's that dunning dunning kruger effect isn't it of you you know enough to be dangerous and then right but then you quickly learn as you get further into the weeds that ah actually there are other ways of looking at this other arguments and, and a, a bit of humility goes a long way i think in in apologetics to make sure that you you really know something before you start saying i, I know it you know yeah and even if you're if you have the right argument if you're arrogant about it you'll lose your audience you know, you have a you run the risk yeah. of, of just losing, alienating listeners. And that's one thing I've really looked up to you uh, in terms of your um, your ability to uh, remain humble, remain quiet at times when I'm just screaming at my iPhone <laughs> at some guest of yours. <laughs> and you just sit there patiently um, letting them letting them talk. And often I think it's it feels strategic, like you, you sense someone talking themselves into a corner of sorts and you just let them continue. But I think at the heart of it is just a, a genuine kindness in you that is uh, deeply Christian, um, you know, I think, and, uh, and it makes you a very persuasive voice in the culture. And every Christian wants to be persuasive, right? To some degree, we all wanna persuade mm. the culture around us and people around us um, toward Christ or some deeper understanding of him. Uh, so I'd be interested in hearing what you think are some of the keys of uh, to sharing uh, or defending the Christian faith in a more mm. persuasive um, or compelling way. Like for Christians that are listening now, what have you learned? Well, obviously, you know, we've already talked about the fact that there are good reasons to believe. I, I think there genuinely are good intellectual foundations <clears throat> for belief in God for the historicity of Christianity. And, you know, there are so many resources available now where you can look those up and, and learn and, and so on. That's that's kind of one one leg, if you like, of the stool. But it, it will be a very wobbly stool if you don't have the other legs, I think. And, and one of those legs is certainly what we've just been talking about, which is the willingness to actually listen to the other yeah. side. Um, because if you don't, if you're not in the, uh, a listener as well as someone who who speaks then you you just won't get an audience i don't think not in today's culture you, you you will immediately be seen as someone who's just got an agenda to put across a certain point of view you're you're a salesperson basically for your thing and and you know people don't like to feel like they're just evangelistic targets or whatever um so i think this is it's got to be relational sadly we live in a social media culture which militates against that because we most of these discussions tend to take place in that format and and that, unfortunately it tends to just result in people getting more and more embedded in their own echo chamber or you know their own perspective it's very hard i think to have a genuine kind of conversation in that format I th it's possible i think some people do actually but it's rare so that's why i think actually a show like unbelievable is still quite important because it does try to model face to face kind of long form gracious right. interaction where you're taking the, the the other person's perspective seriously you're not dismissing it and um and and so yeah that that so and the, so the third stool you know third leg of the stool as it were is is that final bit of first peter 315 you know which is that classic apologetics verse always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you about the reason for the hope that you have but do this with gentleness and respect because you, 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 the the reasons you give won't mean anything or land if they're not done in this this atmosphere of gentleness and respect. Um, you know, there, there's an old saying, isn't there, that you can win the argument but lose the person. And yeah. we're not here to win arguments. We're here to win people. And you could lose the argument and do a better job of actually representing Christianity and making wow. someone potentially want what's on offer, actually. Yeah. Um, if you put them off 
from the outset with the way you conduct yourself and uh, and so on then they're not going to want what's on offer Even, no matter how good your arguments are they're, they're not going to want to be like you and 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 Ooh. in the end people are a a whole mixture of reasons for why they do or don't accept faith it's not it's very very rarely a purely intellectual thing it's it's and right. there's going to be a lot going on in someone's psychology background environment and um the way you conduct yourself i think is is so a much bigger part of that than people often realize that's a really great reminder it's easier said than done um you have uh, had as i said uh, earlier you've you've had all sorts of guests and all different kinds of conversations um if i were to ask you um to think of some of the more heated conversations when things got mm -hmm. out of control like what comes to mind which which conversations or guests come to mind where, when you just thought wow this this went off the rails because well, tempers flared well, or it's funny you should say that because there's one that we haven't put out yet which uh is going to be quite quite full on um so we run a a regular season of six shows um called the big conversation from unbelievable right and yep. these are ones that we do in partnership with john templeton foundation uh, and and these are normally quite you know good well-managed sort of you know academics big thinkers discussing the big issues um as this one was um but it's it's going to be the first show of our next season coming out in april and it's okay. on the resurrection and someone we've already mentioned bart airman is one of the guests on this one uh in a studio with another new testament scholar called justin bass uh okay. and we recorded this fairly recently uh and uh it's a sparky debate. I'll put it that way. Um, <laughs> Justin, Justin kind of uh, goes in. He's he's a, he's a great scholar, but he also he this was his second time meeting with Bart, and I think he wanted to kind of hold Bart's feet to the fire and not not let him, you know, get away from some of the subjects that he wanted to talk about and really press in on. So there are some really interesting moments in that where. It gets right. kind of feisty, and uh, Bart gets a bit annoyed, and there's a bit of back and forth. I mean, we go to irregular breaks in the shows, so we kind of there's it's a moment to kind of pause and, and just kind <laughs> of you know get set up for the next section, and and it was funny because like we we were getting to the end of one section and there were, it was getting heated in the studio. I said, well, look, let's take a break. And Bart said, <laughs> we're just going to have to arm wrestle for this and put his hand on the table. Oh, that's <laughs> was, good. Humor was, can we go a long way. <laughs> but um, so it was, you know, it, it, but yeah, it can get kind of, it, it, that's one example of where, you know, people with, you know, um, definite opinions on something and, and they feel like they want to get it across. It, it can result in that. That definitely, you know, there was also a good amount of just humor in it. And so, so it wasn't too serious. There have been yeah. other occasions um, when, you know, I had to step in and maybe pause the recording, stop because things were one particular one that comes to mind was I had a, a Muslim and Christian guest in this case separated because one was in studio, one was on the phone line. But um, it was on a very I mean, partly my fault for even hosting this this kind of emotive a subject for a Muslim, but <laughs> it was on the, the historicity of Muhammad and that kind of thing. Uh. And it it kind of descended into name calling and a lot of kind of rhetoric and things so, yeah, so it was one of those rare occasions where i had to kind of stop the recording say like guys we've got to calm down here or else i'm not going to be able to carry on and uh i think a lot of listeners if i'm honest found it hard to listen to it afterwards but, yeah you know that's that's the way it goes sometimes sure i can uh sometimes tell when someone walks in with a chip on their shoulder right um, I mean, I've been there, I do it all the time, <laughs> but when others walk in with a chip on their shoulder and, and it can be really arresting. And, and if you're not careful, it can also put you on edge and, and mm. you sort of want to match their, their angst or anger with your yeah. own. Do yeah. you ever feel pulled into that? How do you handle someone who comes in guns blazing, so to speak? I, I, I guess I'm there to, I, I'm not against having some drama in the show. I mean, that can be a good thing. It, you know, uh, sure. we all like to kind of feel like we're part of something that's exciting and a bit tantalizing. Um, but I think it's about knowing sort of what the level is where that spills over into being something maybe unpleasant or unhelpful. Um, and for me, that's, I think then I see myself, I, I, I'm not naturally um, a, I don't, I'm personally am quite, I avoid conflict myself. I'm not a kind uh -huh. of someone who goes in to have arguments with people. 
So I'm a peacemaker. That's my natural mode. And I think on the right. show, I, that comes out in those scenarios where where I I try to maybe find some common ground if I feel like it's it's going too far down the road of you know a lot of disagreement. Um, I right. I maybe if I feel one part party one person is kind of maybe getting the brunt of things even if they're the atheist or whatever in the conversation i might kind of come in on their side and start to sort of ask a few questions on their behalf and and sort of right push it and likewise the, the other way so my my hope is that i kind of act as a kind of uh, a bonding agent that kind of makes hopefully what comes out of the show in the end something that's helpful for for the listener um and yeah. that, that i've i've helped to just help people get on or if we come to an impasse and it's you know we're butting our heads against a brick wall that i can be the one who just okay let's change the subject let's do something else and and that for me is is you know what my role is i'm I'm not there to be the debater i'm there to kind of help a good discussion debate happen right and you don't feel a need to put some kind of a superficial um bow on things as if it's a kumbaya moment at the end of every episode and hey we all actually agree (laughs) And because well, your guests don't, right? That's why you have them on. Um, and and it's not that we all agree; it's that we disagree on these things, but we can still see each, each other's intrinsic value as human beings. We can still respect each other yeah. and even love each other across these aisles. Absolutely. And, yeah. Pro- probably um, one of the the most common ways in which I finish the show is saying, "Well, I guess we'll just have to agree to disagree on this one." <laughs> I'm um, sure. And, and that that that's the nature of these things. Um, you will never i mean very i mean very rarely will as i say will you ever come to the end of the show and everyone's agreed on something you know they came in to to have a discussion on it and and the the hard thing i think is actually sometimes ending a show because someone always in a sense has to have the last word and it's it's very difficult because you know there's always going to be a comeback um that you know there's always going right. to be a, a a counter response that could have been given so trying to just find a natural way to conclude the conversation in a gracious way and and obviously point people in the direction of the resources or whatever if they want to continue it that's that's always right. important but yeah yeah that's that's how it, how it goes it's a uh, it's a funny story how i kind of uh, discovered your podcast initially it was when we were just getting started um here at maybe god i had heard of unbelievable and and you guys before that but i'd never really tuned in um, but after our first episode, um, which our first guest was Bart Campolo, Tony Campolo's son. Mm. Um, and, uh, I don't know what happened to me, but, uh, that man set something off in me that I wasn't prepared for. And, um, his mm. arguments to me were, it's not just that they were nonsensical or what have you. It sparked something in me because I had been misled by those very arguments when I was a college student. And he's now on a college campus. I think it, I allowed it to trigger a lot of emotional stuff in me that I began okay. um, demonstrating in the interview. And and I think I had also been watching too much cable news or, you know, um, <laughs> Daily Wire or something where I just wanted to I wanted to eviscerate my opponent. And um, it was really uh, kind of a mess. I can't go back and listen to that episode now. It's one of our most listened to episodes and it breaks my heart because I think it's maybe our worst, my worst interview for sure. Um, and, it, you know, to many people in that, who were in that scenario, Eric, were you were you? just interviewing him you you were because normally i'm the moderator obviously and i've had bart campolo on my show but it was in conversation with sean mcdowell so in a sense i didn't have to get too involved because sean was doing the kind of the counter arguing were you the kind of essentially representing the christian view on that one i think i was although we had another interview i believe in that um in that time that was supposed to be the opponent to his but they weren't at the same time and so i think i took on the mantle of you know, right. representing yeah. Christendom yeah. to this <laughs> apostate or something. <laughs> and I, it just went out of out of control. So anyway, in the aftermath of that, uh, my producer and uh, the, the team here, w- w- they were looking for resources for me to watch and learn from. And that's where I really started to tune in um, to you and your show. And one thing I remember learning early on is you never want to in any way misstate or misquote mm. your opponent, your let's say you're anyone's really viewpoints. You never Mm. want to um, Mm. quote something back to them in a way that shows your own bias. You never want to misrepresent Mm. anyone's ideas back to them. And that's what I had sort of in my emotional response to Bart Campolo fallen uh, into the trap of. And you do the best job of as generously as possible 
um, sort of uh, uh, summarizing uh, your guests' opinions on things. And, and when you feel like the other guest is not understanding what, what someone's saying, you'll sort of mm. reframe it for them to, you know, mm. to make it through mm. their filter in a way that it hadn't yeah. been getting well, through Well, that's them. kind. Thank you. I, 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 do, I think that, that that is something that has just kind of happened quite naturally. I, and I think it's as much for me as for the audience when I do maybe that little recap. If someone's taken a few minutes to explain quite a big idea, I then try and encapsulate it and then kind of hand it to the, to the other guests to kind right. of respond to. Masterful. But I, I think it's, it's, it's both for me to kind of, okay, this is where we're at. This is what we need to hear next. But I think it helps the audience sometimes as well when these can be quite, you know, big, complex issues and, and sort of having me be able to just frame something and, and then you hear that response can, can be helpful, I think. Right, right. Um, some of the most, I think, heartbreaking conversations I've, I've seen on your show uh, involve like two different kinds of Christians. So you have mm. these shows where you'll have uh, Christians who disagree and... It, it feels sometimes like we're just kind of airing our dirty laundry to the world, but that I understand mm -hmm. this is a necessary thing. We have to have these conversations because not only is the world more divided, the church seems to be more divided mm. than ever. And I don't know if the church is just taking the world's lead and going, uh, you know, dividing along left and right or what, what is happening. But I know more and more when I go to conservative churches or liberal ones, it seems like I'm in two different tribes now uh, mm -hmm. they're speaking mm -hmm. different languages there's different value systems and definitions um, and talking to each other is our only way toward unity mm -hmm. and so i appreciate that but yeah. but do you have any concerns about the fracturing of the church and division within the church widening um let's say in the 17 years since you started the show i think i think there's both good and bad in a sense um at one level, I I actually see that there's, in some circles, there's, there's been more of a willingness for Christians of different denominations or, you know, theological stripes to work together in the sense that as as an increasingly secular culture has, has kind of, you know, arisen, um, I, I increasingly see in the world of apologetics a kind of an openness to, people, you know, uh, maybe someone who is a sort of uh, Protestant working with a Catholic, and an orthodox you know and having a conversation where maybe they're kind of you know their their joint concern is a kind of particular right. type of materialism or secularism and and so so at one level i see sort of sometimes the barriers coming down a bit between those different tribes uh, as they respond together um at the same time <laughs> when you do touch on the very you know strongly held views of one tribe over another be it something doctrinal or something political or cultural or whatever um yeah it, it 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 can be yeah distressing to see the way that christians can actually uh be falling out with each other in such a big way um and and almost I, again i think i think there is a difference between the uk and the usa here um i think the usa is big enough and has enough christians to still kind of be able to have a kind of bit of a silo mentality so you have really distinct tribes that often bump up against each other and really you know critique and slag each other off in the uk we don't quite have that luxury there are you, there are different theological tribes obviously but they don't they tend to do more work together in my experience they tend uh. to kind of find the points of agreement more than than the disagreement and and do do mission together um and and for me i think that's because we don't have the luxury of of kind of all splitting out into our separate tribes because there's not as many of us and we're, sure we're kind numbers, of are yeah. more united in a sense against a kind of you know what you might say is a you know a bigger issue um so so i think that is going on I, has it got worse um i think the problem is that social media and the internet has happened in the last 17 years and that has tended to accelerate the worst aspects of it and you start to be shaped by those forms of media in ways that you ah. maybe weren't before. And and for me, the problem is, you know, and this is not just a religious thing, it's across our political and cultural and ideological, you know, uh, it's it, it has really sharpened um, and made money for these big, you know, internet media platforms yeah. by 
trying to amplify or effectively amplifying the most extreme voices and it creates this kind of uh yeah tribalism culture wars and everything else and i think right. the christian church has just been sucked into that and so we tend to now amplify the the most extreme voices we tend to ha just have lots of arguments um in reality you know when i go on the ground in local churches the most local churches that there is an openness to actually usually having more of an open discussion or whatever um it, it, and and it and it saddens me in a way that that the, the christian church has inevitably been been sucked into that kind of tribalism yeah. and um polarity that now exists in in the world of social media and internet right so my wife and i uh were both ordained united methodist um pastors and we led in the united methodist church for over two decades and recently left the denomination um you know you've talked on your show about the united methodist church so i know you're aware it's a very painful left-right split. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. it was it was supposedly all about um, LGBTQ inclusion. I think it went a little deeper than that. But that aside, there was clearly a a traditionalist versus progressive sort of um, mm. divide. And you've recently tackled the subject of progressive Christianity. And I, if you're willing to talk about this, I, I know this is as sensitive a topic as it gets these days. But do you have? Um, any real concerns about what you see from progressive Christianity and its and its relationship to the uh, deconstructionist movement um, or to decline in the church in general? Like, what are you what are you seeing there? Yeah, yeah, I, I do, I do. And as I say, I mean, I try to steer a careful line where I'm. I, I, I you know, the problem is that. The uber conservatives and the uber progressives they're they're kind of cut from the same cloth um yes <laughs> it's there there is a sort of very it things are non-negotiable you know it's my way or the highway and to that extent it's it those two extremes are the ones where you have the hardest trouble actually getting people to have fruitful conversations because um you know these these issues that, that they see as sacrosanct are are non-negotiable in that sense and and that's really difficult and so trying to find common ground i think and and sort of that, that isn't at those extremes is is the really important thing i do think you know there are absolutely dangers with the the very progressive forms of christianity um i think a lot of it is just simply sacrificing historic orthodox christianity and what that means is sacrificing Jesus at the end of the day. It's 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 mm. getting rid of what is for me the heart of the Christian faith, which is the radical call of Jesus, um, to deny ourselves and follow Him. And they would uh, push back against that, right? I, I, exactly. And I I I don't again want to be sort of. I'm not going to name any names with this because I, I'm painting with a very broad brush stroke, and you'd want to have yeah. the conversation with each individual to work out where they stand on on an issue or whatever. But I guess that's my my concern is is I think I have seen evidence that you know um, the pro the progressive Christian thing can lead to um, a, a sort of deconstruction or kind of questioning everything kind of almost uh, the kind of skepticism that's not th there's good skepticism and there's bad skepticism I think there's there's a kind of skepticism uh -huh. that that is important where you're asking questions and and pushing and and trying to work out what's what and there, there's a kind of another one that's that's more like an acid that just eats away at everything and uh mm. for me it it's when um you can no longer sort of affirm you know the historic core of christian of what christianity is that that you've kind of lost yeah. something and at which point you're potentially just now becoming yet another social cultural uh thing in the in the stream and and you lose your distinctiveness um i mean right. it's interesting to me that i mean I've, I've i've had a number of guests on the show and i've got a book coming out on this subject um called the surprising rebirth of belief in god um which looks a lot at the the way in which the culture wars and everything else has sort of split yes the church to some extent split culture certainly um but the way in which that it's made some unlikely bedfellows of you know folks who are maybe on the more conservative side who are not christians who, who are secular folk but who are sort of um have joined forces to some extent with some christians um mm. and the way in which some 
secular thinkers and intellectuals are kind of starting to I think reappreciate reconsider the Christian story or at least the meaning that gave us as a culture because right. they're seeing suddenly there's a free for all in terms of now any story you know is is valid any story can you know potentially be someone's story and right to that extent I, I think that um the the issue for me is is that Christianity has this ha, is the story that has kind of defined the West for so long, and as soon as you lose that, as soon as you kind of go off into any other story, if as soon as that story stops being the central story, and I think that's the problem in progressive Christianity. Sometimes other stories start to dominate the the Christian story. Mm. Uh, you you lose what is the driving force of the thing, and and one of the people I've that, that I mentioned or and tell the story of in the book is um, the secular historian Tom Holland, who has right. written a book called Dominion and he's become quite well known now in Christian and non Christian circles. I've had him on the show a few times, and he he sort of skets, you know spells out this thesis of the way in which the West really was shaped by the Christian Revolution, all of the ideals of human equality and value and dignity, human rights really came from that and not from anything else right. and um and what and and he kind of makes this great case for the way that that christianity has shaped the west and what he says about the church now is he, he thinks it would be a tragedy for the church to just now kind of become another part of popular culture and and, and yeah. lose its distinctiveness he's very much about keeping christianity weird as he says that's that he says <laughs> is what is interesting and distinctive it. about it and and I think I agree with him. I think, you know, it, as soon as we start to just basically ape all of the trends of today, um, we, we do lose something very distinctive and weird and countercultural about Christianity. And it was always that that actually fired it. It was always this weird belief that God had become human and died a criminal's death on a cross. I mean, that was about as weird and countercultural as very you could weird, get yes. in the first century. <laughs> It's now become part of our, you know, it's become so familiar that we've almost forgotten how weird it is. But right. the church now needs to to kind of reclaim its weirdness almost, but do it with grace. And that's that's the hard thing, isn't it? Do it in yeah. a way where we're actually not simply just becoming another clanging bell in the culture wars and, and so on. Yeah. Yeah, I love uh, I love uh, Tom's appearances, uh, like I know him, Tom Holland's appearances on your show. Um, and he's also a great follow on Twitter, by the way, if you're on Twitter and listening yeah. right now. Um, <laughs> Tom Holland, the historian, not Spider-Man, but... Um, yes. <laughs> Some, sometimes yeah. confused with, with the other one. <laughs> right. Uh, not Zendaya's boyfriend, but the, the, uh, the historian, uh, Tom Holland. Um, so you have uh, you've had all sorts of of celebrity voices on your show as well, and and a lot of these voices have been part of the deconstruction movement. You've been tracking with deconstruction before it was cool uh, for years, and, um, <laughs> and and you know had, having the likes of um, you know Michael Gunger and separately Lisa Gunger, uh, his wife, um, who's in a very different place I think than than Michael is, but mm. they walked that that story uh, together. Uh, the story of deconstruction and sort of um, walking away from church in a traditional sense. What are some of the common threads you're seeing in the deconstruction movement? Um, you know, among those who are who are doing this this work of deconstruction. I I, th I think I think what I tend to see, and again, I don't I don't want to sound patronizing when I say this, but I I think the, one of the problems is that deconstruction is happening because a lot of people probably and the reason we're hearing about it a lot is because people with large platforms are finally kind of letting their their kind of thinking and theology catch up with with where they are in terms of being these kind of quite well-known representations of of christianity so michael gunger i think is a case in point where you know he's he's been on it you know i think for a, the last two decades basically he, he his perspective has been changing all the time and but a lot of people kind of you know got on that bandwagon back when he was producing friends like you know they're producing songs like i'm a friend of god with israel houghton and and was kind of the, right. you know the orthodox michael gunga and now he's kind of in a completely different place um and and it's because he's sort of basically work you know going on a 
a lot of a big personal journey obviously in, in which you land somewhere very different now the thing is everyone i think goes on journeys I mean, my, the theology i have is different to what it was 20 years ago in sure. various respects right um so it's not as though change doesn't happen the deconstruction thing though is i think when i don't know i i guess it's just when um a whole variety of things i can think there's a whole lot of catalysts that kind of pile into that um i think often it's it can be influenced it certainly there's there's intellectual issues very often it's kind of the people that i see deconstructing in a sense didn't have a firm basis on which their faith was constructed in the first place because it was a very fundamentalist or narrow view of faith in the bible and that kind of thing and 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 i think there's a kind of almost um mm. a sense in which a lot of the people who are deconstructing are basically just having to pull apart everything and some of them are not getting to the point where they can pull it put it back together again because they were never kind of given that option it, it's like it's, it's either this or nothing and they've kind of thought well i, I think i'm gonna have to abandon it all now whereas i think if the church was doing a better job of giving people a a, a kind of a more solid basis for their faith and not kind of insisting on on some kind of very particular um way of understanding say i don't know the first chapters of genesis and if if you don't disagree with us on this then you cannot be a christian that that's one of the issues i think it's it's the starting point and then you feed in other things like christian hypocrisy or the politicization that's happening in you know right. large parts of the, of the usa um you feed in um you know culture and lgbt and everything else and i think um it, it it can build to a point where for a certain number of people they just feel like they have no option but to basically you know give up on the christian faith that they certainly had now a certain number of those i see kind of eventually making a journey back round to a a new more reconsidered faith but i think a lot of them are either still on that journey or they they kind of they haven't got the impetus to come back and sort of try and find a, a new way of understanding and uh, and getting into the faith and um michael gunger is quite unique i i mean i i he's he's kind of gone in a very kind of esoteric mystical right. eastern kind of direction i don't tend to find that's necessarily typical of of all those who are deconstructing um and and more often i i find it's you know that that word itself covers a lot of bases and you know, sure for some it some i think it is just a natural process of reframing their theology and and find you know finding a, a different way of being a christian it doesn't necessarily mean they've kind of completely left historic orthodox christianity altogether right. so uh yeah so that I, I guess i don't know if that helps but that's that's kind no, of my does. Big picture take on it it's like what you said earlier everyone's faith is is evolving and changing over time it should be i mean i hope we have different views you know 10 years from now than we do today i hope those changes though are based on you know certain certain guidelines and and um beacons like like scripture and you know um the best of of the you know christian tradition uh in terms of teaching on various issues and things like that that goes way back in christian history um and and not just on my feelings or you know on what uh what my heart's mm -hmm. telling me in any given moment about some issue or what the you know what i like or don't like about christians in my life so I, I think your point is is well taken. Um, now, as a father, um, you have two children. Is that right? Four children, actually. Four. I'm so sorry. Four children. Ages are 18 and what else? The the 18, uh, 14, 11, and seven. Wow. How do you have time for interviews like this in the middle of the day? God bless you. Um, uh, what are, what are you and your wife doing to sort of um, to prepare your children for what the future of the world and the future of Christianity is going to going to look like, how are you raising them, mm. um, and how has your work on Unbelievable shaped your parenting style? It's, it's a great question, um, and I do not, again, by any means, say that we're doing this as well as we could, or that we're some sort of model for this. But I think the key for us is that we know we cannot seal them off from the reality of the world they live in the social media their friends the culture around them and and if i've learned anything from unbelievable it's that the best approach i think is just to to, to go in with your eyes wide open and so mm. the, the you know we use 
every opportunity we get really whether it's driving them somewhere in the car or around the dinner table or whatever to just talk and say hey what's going on have you seen this what do you think of this and and be kind of open about these issues you know and if it's like the issues issues around sexuality you know we know that we can to some extent we could police what they're watching on netflix or anything else but that's that you can only do so much uh and you can't sort of shield a, a child from the reality of the kind of influences they're going to have and and so it's about having i think honest open conversations about that and saying what mm. do you think of that and here's have yeah. you thought about this perspective what about that this is yeah you're you've got a friend who says they're transgender let's talk about that and it's kind of um it's it's just trying i think to to kind of remind in as gracious a way as you can um what the what the basis of who we are and identity is in Christ and that um that our love for them you know is absolutely kind of a, unconditional just as God's love for us is but that we want to have grown up conversations with them as you know obviously as as it's appropriate for their age right um, about the issues that they're facing and not kind of just i think the mistake would always be to try and put your kids in a christian bubble yes because you can, that bubble will get popped whether you like it or Absolutely. not and it's either now or later so just kind of help them to to go out into the world with their eyes wide open and hopefully model god's love to them and uh, and and introduce them to some good theology through the conversations that you're having with them right yeah and i think that approach to parenting and your approach to your show uh, it sort of embodies a quiet confidence in christ like, um, we don't need to run from what's out there. We don't need to pretend like arguments against Christianity or against God himself or, you know, transgenderism or other kinds of things aren't out there. They're out there. And we are all going to encounter people and um, people who are struggling in various ways and people that don't don't agree to what we ascribe to and as Christians. And, and so it's much better to have these conversations and uh, to raise children and to... Uh, and encourage one another to not be afraid of these conversations because you know mm. we, if if our faith is fickle enough to fall apart with a you know a, a simple disagreement um you know or a, a competing argument um then how strong is our faith in the first place right and i think mm. uh, i think it's important yeah. that we Absolutely. that we yeah no I, I, I couldn't agree more and yeah i i i think that's the way to go i, I think we live in the the genie's out of the bottle, in a sense. You can't live in a Christian bubble anymore. I think you could, you know, 20, yeah. 30, 40 years ago. But yeah. I, I just don't think you can anymore. And I think um, I think the reason Unbelievable has, has in a sense, seemed to, to chime with so many people is because we said, look, let's, let's put Christianity out there in the public sphere. Let's have grown-up conversations where we're not going to try to present some kind of, yeah, uh, pat apologetics or, right. you know, only one perspective. And, and you know, my kids know that that's what I do for a living. In our church, you know, as I said, my wife's a minister, we, we try and embody that same sense that, look, we're open. We're not kind of closed off to hearing other people's points of view. Um, we, we're aware that in our congregation, there's quite a diversity of opinions on different things. Um, mm. And yet we somehow managed to live in the tension of that. We somehow managed to say, look, what unites us is bigger than what divides us. Um, right. That's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy to do. But I believe, you know, miracles happen. Jesus was raised from the dead. Uh, it's possible for God to work even in in difficult situations uh, and, and still bring, you know, his his love and his unity out, you know, in that. Right. Amen. There's one more quote I'll share um, from your book, Unbelievable. Um, it says, uh, in the end, faith is not merely about belief. It's about learning to trust the God we cannot see to make sense of the world we can. I think that um, mm. is a beautiful summary of what we're all about. And in light of this understanding you've gained about faith, would you say your show and hosting your show all these years has, has deepened your faith? Mm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It, it feels like I've had the privilege of, of kind of having, um, I don't know, a, a theology degree and a, a, a cultural <sighs> studies degree. and everything thrown in. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, 
you know, I don't claim to be an expert on any of these things, but it's there's it's been a wonderful experience to be able to to sit at the feet of some amazing thinkers uh, on on all sides of these debates and and learn and listen and try to pick up what I can and express it as I have. As I say, this doesn't at the end of this, I don't find myself knowing all the answers. Um, there are lots of things still go in the mystery bucket or the I don't know bucket. Um, some of the you know some of my theological views there, there are still plenty of gray areas where i'm not prepared to say i'm this i'm that yeah. or the other but having said all that i would say my faith is much in a sense stronger deeper arguably than it was because i think through all of that through all of the mystery and the you know the nuance at the core of it i found a really reliable story a story that makes sense historically makes sense philosophically makes sense emotionally of us makes sense um of the universe we live in and and kind of who we find ourselves to be in it and i just don't find another story that makes better sense of it than that i i don't find oh. that the atheist naturalist story makes sense it's it's got for me it just doesn't answer enough of the questions that need to be answered i've never found another worldview that that is more compelling than the christian story so so I guess that's why, you know, I, I just think Jesus is the best thing um, out there. <laughs> you, you, still, still nothing better than Jesus, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I know that kind of sound, makes me sound like a good old, you know, South American preacher or something like that. But, you know, that's, uh, that's my, that, that, that's it in the end. You'd me, fit yeah. in, right? In Houston, Texas, you, you just need to come on over here, brother. <laughs> um, I want to thank you uh, once again. And if you're listening or watching this interview, um, I want to encourage you to pick up Justin's book, Unbelievable, with a question mark. Uh, Unbelievable, why after 10 years of talking with atheists, I'm still a Christian. Obviously, you can find his podcast, Unbelievable, uh, just about anywhere you uh, listen to podcasts. And I really encourage you to head over to the thebigconversation.com show where you can see all of the uh, the big conversations that uh, that Justin mentioned earlier uh, Justin Briley I can't think can't thank you enough for all that you've done and meant to us personally and I can't wait to see what's next for you and for your work well thank you Eric it's been an absolute pleasure I, I hope maybe we we can I can come and see you guys in person at some point that would be great fun that would be great fun. Uh, I cannot wait for that. I hope that that happens. Um, and uh, our prayers are with you and all that you're doing. Thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. Great to be with you.